Okay, good morning everyone. Um, so just, uh, just uh, a quick announcement to get started here. So the um, assignments fours are up here at the front that the TAs have graded. Uh, there's also some earlier assignments that have been graded if you haven't picked those up already. And then just uh, one other thing, uh, you've noticed and a few people have been asking about the online quizzes, the quests that are part of this course. There's an allocation of 10% for that in the course outline. Uh, what happened with that is uh, it's a computer-based system and it it's, was under maintenance with myself and a colleague and we've just got it working. So here's what my proposal is. Rather than try to load you with all these short-term quizzes between now and the end of the term. My proposal is to take that 10% weight and divide it equally through the rest of the course allocation. If that is something that you don't want to do, I'm still willing to let you write the quest, but then it's up to you to send me an email and request that. Otherwise, what will happen is that 10% that's allocated to quest will automatically defer and be spread over the weighting of all the other pieces of work that you've done in this course. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave that to your option then. I apologize that, um, that that was a computerized system that I've used in prior courses, but we've gone some, done some maintenance on it and added some stuff, but it only has come through just now a little bit later than I expected. Okay, is everyone clear on that? Any questions, concerns? It is an important point, um, and I don't want to just move on until everyone's quite comfortable with that. Okay, if anything is unclear, uh, send me an email and I can clarify that. What I do want to look at next is this idea from last class of the isotherms. And we were looking at a batch process. And why I want to start here is we're going to very quickly move on today uh, to continuous processes. So last class, we said if we look at a batch process, we had this isotherm. And remember, the isotherm is a plot of the concentration in the fluid phase against the concentration loaded on the solid phase. And by its nature, a batch system, you can close the valve, let it sta stand there, and come to some sort of equilibrium. Given a long time, or in given enough time, you can reach a point on that curve. And last class, we said uh, we can find that point as the intersection of two lines. Uh, the diagonal straight line is a line that just defines the mass balance from the batch. The isotherm is for, for equilibrium. Okay, So a batch by its nature is transient. It, it changes over time. But what we showed is that the batch will operate somewhere along this diagonal line. And then if you leave the batch for long enough, it will come to equilibrium, and that's on this curve. And so where those two curves intersect is where we end up. Once you end up over there, you've essentially answered the question because we were looking for CA and CAS. The last part of that question, which we didn't cover in class, was to calculate the recovery. And uh, you ha if you look at your notes from prior, you have the numbers available to you. But essentially, the formula for recovery is the amount of solute that you adsorbed, that you recovered out of the liquid and moved onto the solid. So solute adsorbed divided by total solute added. Okay, so it's just a ratio of those two masses. Um, and in particular, if you're looking back at your notes and the numbers, that's 0 0.36 divided by 0 0.625. Okay, so if you just want to confirm those numbers, and that's a, a recovery of 58%. Okay, so I didn't get a chance to cover that in last class. Okay, so that was batch systems, and what I'm going to spend today's class is we're going to look at essentially uh, systems that are based on continuous time operation, uh, or that operate certainly for a long time in a continuous mode, and then get shut down do a regeneration and then they operate in continuous mode. So here what happens, let's take a look at this um, case, is we have a packed bed reactor. This is the classical example of adsorption is to have a packed bed reactor. So the technology isn't anything special. 
um, you're comfortable with this idea. And we feed the pack bed reactor with, in this case, we're separating moisture, wet uh, moisture, out of the gas. And what we hope to have leaving is essentially a dry gas free of moisture. So here's the question. This bed is packed with adsorbent in there. We're feeding this material. And what will happen is we feed this wet gas and that moisture has to go somewhere. It stays inside the packed bed. It's loaded onto the adsorbent so that what you see leaving there at the outlet is continual dry gas. It's a steady state dry gas with all the mo all, all, as much as the moisture removed as defined by where we're operating on this isotherm. Okay, so there. The moisture gets retained on the pack bed according to the isotherm. We're going to operate somewhere along this isotherm, and that's going to determine how much gas, uh, sorry, how much moisture is absorbed and then the percentage moisture leaving. And that's steady, 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 steady. You see no change in the moisture, and then suddenly that bed is all used up. Okay? And that moisture value at the dry gas outlet starts to climb up. Right, so the, the moisture's got no, nowhere to go anymore. The bed is fully used. We use the term the bed is loaded. It's at capacity. And so the dry gas starts to now uh, deviate from the required target. And at that moment, we shut the bed off and we regenerate it. Okay? And we'll, we'll regenerate it by simply reversing the flow. We send heat onto the packed bed. In this particular example, we'll use heat. <laughs> Um, we raise the temperature of the, of the adsorbent. The moment we raise the temperature of the adsorbent, we move to a less favorable isotherm. We, we covered this in the last class. At higher temperature, that isotherm might look like that. And so what that does is it drives the moisture off the adsorbent. Okay, so previously, at this point, we could load a certain amount of grams of solute per gram of adsorbent. That's the, what the y-axis value is. And then the moment you heat up the bed, you're now operating at some lower value. So the mass of solute per mass of adsorbent is a lower number. That adsorbent has to go somewhere. It, it desorbs is the term we use. It desorbs off the solid phase and goes back into the vapor phase. And that's why we have this cooler condenser here. We catch that moisture in this example and we, we remove it. The bed is dried. We remove the adsorbent, sorry, we remove the solute. In this case, it's moisture, and we regenerate the bed. And then we can go stop this, and we switch back to the mode on the left-hand side. So you're always alternating between using the bed and regenerating it. Now, that's not the only way that you can regenerate the bed. There's several other ways, one of which is to lower the pressure. You draw a vacuum, or you move to some lower pressure, and what that will do is change the partial pressure of the, of the bed, of the solute, and get the solute back into the vapor phase. Okay? So you simply drive the solute back off by lowering its partial pressure, or by lowering the total pressure, I should say. The other way that you could also desorb is by replacing the sites on the adsorbent with some other species. Steam is a, is a good one that often gets used. You can displace your solute with steam, drive off your solute, um, and that actually does both here. It raises the temperature and it displaces the, the previous solute, and you regenerate the bed in that way. So there's several alternatives. Okay, so we're going to look at what's going on in, the, in that bed during the, the stage where we load it up, right? It's not, it's not just um, a straightforward process that goes on there. Let's understand what, what happens. So yes, if you've used steam, then you'd need to cool the bed back down again to let steam go off again. Yeah. So you've got to, um, you've got to do a, a, a cooling step as well. Now let's, um, let's perhaps talk about that. This is a, a, leads into a continuous bed. So here's the same idea as this prior slide. In this prior slide, the bed stays fixed. The other option is that you can move your bed. Okay, the bed doesn't need to be uh, stationary. 
Um, what we actually do in this particular example is we move the solid phase around. So the solid phase moves in a counterclockwise manner, shown there by the pointer. So solid is coming down, it's cooled, it's just been regenerated, so we need to cool it down. And what we have is my feed with, with solute comes in over here and is going to rise up. It's going to encounter the solids coming down, so there's this countercurrent motion, and the solute is going to be adsorbed. The solute is adsorbed, and what we have leaving over here is the feed with the solute removed, or mostly removed. The feed will also, um, some of it will continue down, and what we'll then apply is heat down here. So the solids have moved down here. We'll apply heat to drive that solute off, and that solute then will leave here in the bottom product. The solid now that's heated goes down here, gets pumped back up to the top and recirculated. So your bed is moving around um, in this particular example. Okay, and you can, um, you can do that several times. You'll use cyclones to recover the solid separated from the vapor. And if you want to see this, the magnitude of one of these units, here's an example um, in Burkina Faso. It's an uh, example, so you, you can get an idea of scale from the people over there building it. And then you can see down here, there's actually the bags of adsorbent sitting there on the ground that they're going to load into this hopper over there. So that hopper is your feed entrance in. Notice there's the return feed, the pneumatic feed up to the top of the tower, which is unfortunately cut off. We don't see that. And then you've got your column down there. So that's just a, a picture of the prior cross-sectional diagram. Okay, so though that's, um, that's more of a continual mode. You'll never have to shut this unit down because it's constantly being uh, regenerated uh, down here, cooled, and your solids just keep circulating. You just top them up periodically to replace broken, broken adsorbent. Okay, because you're moving it and pumping it, you're going to damage it, and it's, um, you're going to have to replace it. So what we're going to look at next now is this packed bed reactor and what, what goes on in there. So let's um, go to this slide. Okay, and I'm actually going to have you work through this for a few minutes on your own. Slide 34 and slide 35. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. You'll notice slide 34 over here and 35 on the next page has a left and a right hand side. Okay, so let's take a look at that. There's several sets of graphs on the left hand side and then an equivalent set of curves on the right hand side. And what we're looking at there is a packed bed. Now, here we're drawing it horizontally only to make, make the graphs work for us. These beds are not normally oriented horizontally. They're normally oriented vertically. But we're, we're going to look at it in this way. And here's what I want you to do. There's a curve on the left, a curve on the right, and they're changing. And work with the person next to you. One of you pick the left-hand side and figure out what's going on there. And the other person pick out the right-hand side and figure out what's going on and explain it to each other. Now, it's, the questions I want you to ask is, what is on the y-axis? Okay, so answer that question first. What is on the x-axis? Answer that question next. And then thirdly, what is happening on the sequence of the plots. Okay, so the plot has a definite sequence to it. What is happening on the sequence of plots? So one of you works down the left-hand column over both slides. Remember, it continues on to the next slide. The other person works on the, the right-hand side, and then you can explain it to each other. And if you have a split order, split, uh, what's the term I'm looking for, split personality, you can sit by yourself and explain it to yourself. But I would prefer you to work with the person next to you.
This is not obvious. There's a lot of detail in here. Only if you're registered for 4W. I'm not registered, but I got the email. Yeah, it's, I, as I said in the email, yeah, you may not apply okay. to you, yeah. Because I don't know, I just go to the top of the list and see in, like the year levels, and it, there's a lot of people that are not registered in that. Yeah. I'm assuming it's because it's the second semester or fourth year? Yeah. So if you're in level four, I may have emailed it to you. But, but you're not actually registered yet for that course, yeah. Yeah. You'll take it next year, yeah. Or the year after. Just general, just general time. No, it's theta. Oh, okay. Just a, it's a generic theta. Okay. Just it's like t. Time t. Okay, so let's um, let's go, let's hear some some comments. What's on the y-axis on the left-hand side? What value? What quantity are we showing there? On the y-axis, on the sorry, sorry yeah, yeah. Okay, concentration of the solute on the bed, on the solid phase. Okay, so that's. CAS on the y axis on this side anyone 
What quantity are we seeing there? Adsorbent, the solute concentration, specifically where on that where on that system? In the outlet. In the outlet, okay. So right over here, if you're putting an analyzer on the unit over here, we're going to plot this value. We'll just call it C A. Okay. What's on the x axis on the left hand side? What quantity are we showing on the x-axis? Which length? The length of the bed. OK, so you've got your packed bed here. And so it's the, the length L for that solid phase. So length, constant cross-sectional area length is essentially also can be mapped onto the weight of the material that you have. And on the y, on the x-axis on the right-hand side is this value theta, which is time, okay? So very different axes. We're plotting time over here. And we're going to plot essentially mapped onto this bed over here. So here's the of length L. So two views. We're, you've got to be able to see two things. We're going to look at the solid. Now, the solid doesn't move but the solid changes from the beginning to the end of the reactor. And then if you're standing here with your analyzer, your probe, and you're measuring the solute concentration, we're going to be able to plot that against time. Okay. So what happens is initially we're feeding there with CA coming in. You've got a concentration of the solute with a certain concentration at the feed F. Okay. So CAF. And what this curve is showing you, let's just focus here on the right-hand side for now. What are we going to measure here on our probe? We just regenerated the bed. We've just turned it on. What are we going to measure there at the probe? Right. Yeah. CA should almost be zero. Okay, so all any material that you're feeding here is being taken up by the solid. Okay, so leaving the packed bed, you should see nothing. Or close to undetectable, all of that solute should be taken up. Okay, so this line should be roughly roughly down here. Okay, so some small number. Now we keep feeding solid, uh, sorry, we keep feeding, feeding solute in our, at our feed. And that material has to start going somewhere. That solute is being adsorbed onto the solid phase. And we get this idea then, if I could take this reactor, this packed bed, and I could freeze it at a moment in time, you could go in there and sample the packed solid. Okay, so you could go take samples of the adsorbent. So you could take samples over here. And then plot the concentration of the solute on that solid phase. Okay. And what the curve on the right hand, sh uh, sorry, the left hand side is showing you is what that curve, what that concentration would look like. So this is showing something like that. Okay is this Z shape. So those values would map down here. Okay. Make sense so far? No? I'm not seeing any agreement. <laughs> yes, Sean. Yeah, so the theta we're at is we're, we're frozen the bed at some particular point in time. We're not long, we haven't operated the bed long enough that we've used it all up. Okay. okay, so we're at some intermediate point. We're going to get to the 
what's going to happen at the end, okay, when the bed is used up. But I want you to make sure that this is, this is clear. Some capacity of the bed up at the front is, is used up. Some capacity of the bed at the end is unused. Okay, is that, that's got to be clear. Is that some of the bed is used, some of it is not used. Okay. Now let me ask this question. We're going to be, at this particular point in time, at the curve can be shown like that. Now let's take, take the bed, operate it for a little while more, so maybe operate it for a few more minutes, and then if you repeated this fictitious ability that you could freeze the bed and take samples, what you would notice the next time is that sort of shape. That blue line has just shifted over exactly the same shape, but just shifted over in the length of the bed. Okay. And we give a name for it. So we call it the wave. Like you've all done the wave in a, in a sports stadium or at some event, right? So it's exactly that same idea. It's the wave. It moves through the bed at, the, at a constant rate. So now we're at this green curve. Let me just uh, clean up this diagram a little bit. Okay. And we've got this idea here that there's some portion of the bed. We'll, I'll define exactly how we define this, but this is not used. Okay, that portion is unused. And in fact, we'll, we'll give a specific name to it, LUB, length of unused bed, LUB. But here, I want to just quickly uh, make sure that you test your knowledge a little bit. At this particular portion of the bed, so right up, so sort of in this earlier region, I want us to understand what the state of the bed is at that particular point. And I want to do that by asking, where are we on the isotherm? So here's my isotherm. Let me just draw that a little bit. And remember, this axis here is Ca, the concentration in the coming in in your solid in your feed. Sorry, the concentration. of solute per meters cubed of fluid. And on this vertical axis, we've got CAS, which is the grams of solute per gram of adsorbent. OK, so at the start of the bed over there that's been used up, we might be somewhere on this xy axis. Where, where are we? Are we on the line or off the line? at the beginning of the bed? Would we be on the curve or somewhere else? Just think about it for a minute. This is going to test your knowledge. Yeah, so some thoughts on the curve, off the curve. Helen? We're on the curve because we're in equilibrium, okay? Does that seem to make sense? No, doesn't seem to make sense. Remember, this green curve is going to shift over, right? And a few minutes later, that green curve is going to look like this. So we're dealing in here, in that zone. That zone, nothing changes. Once that solid is used up, it's used up, okay? And it's in equilibrium. It's in equilibrium with what? What's, where am I on this horizontal axis? Right, so if I know I'm on the red curve, I need to be able to find myself also on the x-axis. How, how far am I on the x-axis? Am I over here at the origin? 
it's an easy question to answer. When you look at this particular part of the bed, what's the concentration of A in terms of grams of solute per meter cubed of fluid? CAF, okay, so yeah, what you started with, right? So you're at CAF. Whatever your inlet concentration is, that's where you are on that equilibrium curve. In that initial part of the bed. So in this zone, you're at equilibrium. That's the key insight. If you don't understand that, you need to think through it a, through it a little carefully. Right, we've got our feed coming in. This bed is all used up. So material, if we think back, back to the equilibrium derivation from the prior class, material is loading onto the solid as fast as it's desorbing. So it's adsorbing and desorbing at equal rate. We're at equilibrium. That's the definition of equilibrium. And we know then that we're on the isotherm somewhere. Give me an x-axis value or a y-axis value, and I can find that point. It's the easiest one to give is the x-axis value. We can measure CAF. I know that. And so as a result of that, I can actually find out immediately what CAS is. Okay. And we will give that a special name. You'll see it here, CASE, to emphasize that point. Okay. So that particular value is CASE. Or you might even want to emphasize it for yourself. Okay, so you're in equilibrium there. Back to the question I asked on Wednesday's class. What if you could buy an adsorbent that looked like this? Would that be a better adsorbent? Yeah, because we can then load on a little bit more solute per kilogram of adsorbent. Okay. What if your boss comes to you and says, you know what, um, we want to increase CAF a little bit more. Is that going to change things? Not too much, right? You're going to barely shift to there, right? If, you were, if CAF was down here, okay, so if CAF was over here, then absolutely changing things up and down has a, has a big effect. But if you're operating at this point of the isotherm, changes in CAF have very little effect. Right? You've sort of flattened out. Okay, so, so I want you to have that insight of this process isn't going to stay the same year after year. It's going to, you're going to be having changing requirements on it. Okay, so you're going to either change the adsorbent or you're going to change your inlet concentration. Okay, so that's this idea of the inlet zone. Let's talk a little bit about the person standing here with the probe at the end. They're going to read, they're going to have a pretty boring job. They're going to see nothing. All the time, they're just going to read nothing, 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 nothing. Okay. Until what happens? Joseph? The whole bed gets saturated. The whole bed gets saturated. So, are we going to see that? Well, I guess once it gets close to being saturated. Okay, close to being saturated. Right, so we're not going to see a step happening here at the end. We're going to see an S happening. Actually, the mirror, almost a mirror image of what's happening there. Right, we're going to see the solute. You're going to stand there with your probe, and then you're going to see this rise. Now, you're not going to let this happen. In practice, the moment that starts to peak up, you stop the bed and you say, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to regenerate. Right? Because the purpose of why you're running this bed is so that you get that solute adsorbed. Right? If you keep running the bed, you're allowing your solute just to go through and leave again. Okay? Now, let's... Yeah, sorry, yeah. With experience, but um, we'll, we'll come back to that. So you, there's a finite number of cycles that you can regenerate. So you would still monitor. Yeah. But yeah, if you know where your flow coming in, your flow coming in is exactly related. We'll derive the balance in a minute to what, how long it's going to take. Okay. So 
let's say you don't stop the bed. Let's say you do plan to keep running it. What's going to be the concentration that you read right over here? CAF, okay. You've used all the bed up, and now anything coming in just leaves again. You've just got a, a glorified pipe with useless adsorbent in it. Okay, so there's nothing, nothing happening anymore. So you will get back up to CAF eventually. The goal of a pack of this adsorbent process is to stop it at some t time, and the time that you stop it at is theta b, the breakthrough time. Now, you will stop it there with one, it depends on your company's policy. You'll typically stop theta b the moment you reach the minimum detectable level that you want. So if this is a contaminant or a toxin, the lowest value that you can detect it at, the moment that starts to be detected on your probe, you stop. Or it might be that you have some upper bound, right? So 500 parts per million. Your probe can measure below 500 parts per million, but if 500 parts per million is your maximum tolerable bound, that's the point where you'll stop your bed. So theta b is something that you have under your control. You know when that's going to happen. Okay. So let's take a look at what happens the top curve, the top two curves show us what the time where you freeze the bed at theta b, what does the solid phase look like? Well, the solid phase shows that you're in equilibrium and it drops down to that lower zone. If you keep operating the bed, that wave starts to move across, okay? And you've, you've essentially used all your bed up. The entire bed is in equilibrium. Now, you never really get to these four curves. You would pretty much stop your process there after the top set of curves. Okay, is that clear? Okay, now let's, um, let's go derive a little bit of um, terminology here. We've got this idea length of unused bed and what we'll typically do is we'll say, you know, I'm just going to redraw this again so there's only one curve. We'll take this point where it's about midway, okay, and we'll call that LUB, the length of unused bed. We just split the difference a bit. That's the LUB, and this part up here we call the LES. LES is for length of equilibrium section. LES. Okay. So those terms are defined. There's a bit of another graphical way for, to look at it, but those terms are defined here on this slide, LES and LUB. And the total of the two must add up to the total length of the bed. Okay, if you add LUB plus LES up, you get the total bed length. Either the bed is unused or it's considered to be in equilibrium. Now, LES isn't truly the length of the equilibrium section, right? If you want to be really picky about it, that part of the bed is truly in equilibrium, and there's something else happening here. So let's talk a little bit about that. Right? If you had, and just l let me erase this curve. If you had the perfect adsorbent, the perfect adsorbent would have a shape that look like that. So here I'm plotting L. And that length would be LES. And this length would be LUB. Okay. The perfect adsorbent would have that sort of shape. Where if you looked at it, at some point in time and you froze the bed, you could draw a straight line and say this part is in equilibrium and this part is unused. Okay, but in practice we will never have that perfect division. Why not? Why, why is that? What might, I think you've got a, you may have a sense of this from prior courses. Why do we have this zone over here where we can't really tell the two apart?
Okay, mass transfer is happening not necessarily at the same rate that the fluid's flowing. It's a good, good reason. And anything else that's happening? What, what do we know about packed beds and the reality of packed beds? Right, we don't reach equilibrium instantly. It's not an instantaneous reaction. There's a reaction rate. So that's again, ties in with Neil's idea that the reaction is occurring. There's, you've got to wait for things to happen. Yeah. Um, we assume it's plug flow, but it might not actually be. We're assuming plug flow, but it might not actually be, right? So you get channeling. Parts of your fluid flows at a slightly faster velocity if it's not evenly packed. Another reason why we orient these beds vertically, it's a lot easier to pack a bed vertically than it is to pack it horizontally. So we'll, we'll channel, um, we can get channeling and bypassing in a real bed. So you get what we call an MTZ forming, a mass transfer zone. That mass transfer zone is the zone where ex exactly what's, what was said there, mass transfer is happening. Material takes a while to reach equilibrium. We don't get to equilibrium instantly. Right? If you got to equilibrium instantly, another way of saying that is your reaction rate constant is super fast. Right? That's all that, all that fast equilibrium means is that you've got an incredibly fast reaction rate. If you've got a slow reaction rate, you may have to wait some time. Right? And that's what that MTZ is all about. Okay? So in reality, we'll split the MTZ at 50-50 and give some to LES and give some to LUB. Okay? So if you could get an adsorbent that had a, a sharper shape, right? so if you could buy an adsorbent that closely matched that sort of ideal behavior, that would be great. But we, we can't always buy that sort of thing. Yeah. Sorry, if you had that, wouldn't it then be a step change in your effluent? So then that would be, you wouldn't want that, right? But all of a sudden it's 100% would be. Right, yeah, your effluent would also jump up very suddenly. Yeah, but you, you'd still be able to cut it depending on how fast you, you were able to measure. Essentially, what's going to happen here with this particular example, let's take a look at this graph. This illustrates it quite nicely. The horizontal line is the, is the perfect case, right? We don't have the square wavefront moving through and leaving. So what happens is you get this S-shaped curve happening. And when you get to this particular illustration, the fourth one from the left, that's when you start to get breakthrough. You have to stop the bed. So in fact, all the adsorbent that's packed in that zone up there goes unused. If you stop the bed, you never get to use that adsorbent. Right? And then you regenerate the bed, you run this backwards, you clean the bed up, and then you go forward, and you'll always stop at this point. That last part of the bed, that tailpiece, always remains unused. Okay, so we would, if we can find an adsorbent that has a sharp wave front, like this, we'll, we would go for that preferentially. Okay, so let me, um, I'm going to go to a new slide here. Now this is one that I know you don't have. So I have a copy of it here for you. Um, I'd like you to hand, uh, pass it around and I'll quickly work through that. And then on the flip side of the handout is, uh, is a problem for you to, to work on. So I, I've posted this electronically on the course website as well, but I know that probably didn't have a chance to print it. Okay, so let me, uh, let's me quickly work through this mass balance with you. It's simple, very, very simple, in fact. It says the following. If we're going to feed our, our flow here at CAF, we're going to come into our reactor with that concentration. I'm going to run my pack bed reactor for some period of time. So essentially, we're doing a mass balance
from theta equals zero seconds to your breakthrough point in time. So if you accumulate all the mass that's come into your reactor at that point in time, it's a very straightforward mass balance. On the left hand side, it says QF. QF is your meters cubed of fluid per second. We're going to multiply that by CAF, your feed concentration. So that's kilograms of solute per meter cubed of fluid. So we get some cancellation there. And if you run it for theta b seconds, you're going to run it for that long. You're going to get time canceling. And so it's essentially just a mass of total sol of solute added. Okay, so that left-hand side then is equal to mass of solute added. Now that solute has to go somewhere. Right, so if you want, on the left-hand side is simply tells you how much you've added. Where did it all go? Well, let's, uh, let's look at the other side of the equation. CAS equilibrium. Why, why CAS equilibrium? Right, that solid went somewhere. Remember, if we draw the profile, and I'm going to draw the profile of CAS inside the reactor here for you. CAS over time at theta b looks like that. Okay, we saw that in the prior slide. It is, in fact, if you want to go back to it, you can make a note for yourself that that equation essentially is an equation of what's happening in graph D and graph K. So in graph D, we're seeing that CAS looks like this and then drops down to there. Okay. And what happens is we can write, where did that solid go? Well, the solid got loaded up in the equilibrium section. In the LES. That's where the solute went. It got loaded up and it's in equilibrium with that. And so the concentration on the solid phase is CAS equilibrium. And that has units of kilograms of solute per kilogram adsorbent. Okay. Well, I need kilograms of solute on the right-hand side to make this balance work. The, the units must be consistent. So let's, let's aim to get that. One way we can get that is multiply by the density of the solid, the, the adsorbent. So the density, now we have to be careful. It's not the density of the particles, it's the density as you've packed it in the reactor. How have we packed it? Well, we use this density and the supplier will always give this to you, rho b, the density of the adsorbent, the bulk density. So that's kilograms of adsorbent. And I use the idea meter cubed occupied space. Okay. Well, how much meter cubed of occupied space do we have? We have A times LES, the cross-sectional area times the length of the equilibrium section. Oh, running this in the wrong place. Okay. And that has units of meter cubed occupied space. Okay, and then What have I done wrong here? Yeah, oh, it's right. Okay, so it's a simple mass balance. Solid in, solid must have gone somewhere. Okay, that will, this equation, if I solve it, it will get me one number that I'm really interested in, the length of the equilibrium section. That's part of the deal, but it still doesn't tell me how big my reactor is. To tell me how big my reactor is, I need to know LUB. The only way that you can find LUB is by doing lab experiments. And if you don't have that opportunity, we can use this approximation that LUB is equal to four times, the, um, use the mass transfer zone distance equal to four feet, 
and then use the idea that LUB is equal to 2 times MTZ. Okay, so if you don't have data, that's a, a fair enough approximation. It will probably make a reactor that's a little bit too big for you. Okay, but once you have LUB of 8 feet, then you can work and calculate the total length of the reactor. So the problem that you have on the other side of the page uses this equation. Give it a try. Work through that. And I have, uh, people have been requesting more problem sets. So I have another one here at the front in print as well if you'd like to come pick one up. A second problem for you to work on as well as your previous assignments.